Yes, so I have to thank Yana for setting up the discussion so well. She's talked about data-driven innovations and the theme of our panel discussion is basically AI and humanity and I think that ties in very well with what's happened in the discussion before. They talked about examples of how data is being used. But data never actually makes sense until it benefits the end users, the, hu the humans behind the technology. So t we have here today Charles, who is the director of Accenture AI, and Janet, who is lead data scientist at Oracle, and also Needy. And Needy is co-founder and CEO of a startup called Portcast. It's very exciting. It's applying smart technology to the shipping and the logistics industry. So let's just dive straight into the discussion. When we talk about AI and humanity, I'm actually going to put a controversial twist to it. So Scott Belsky, who's the chief product officer at Adobe, said within the first 15 seconds, any human is either lazy, vain, or selfish. When you open your Facebook app, you want to see what your friends think about you. When you open the Grab app, you are looking to save time with a taxi because you'd rather not walk. You're lazy. So I was wondering, opening it up to our panelists, how do you, when talking with your customers, start to move be beyond those human tendencies and build trust with your customer to deliver something that's actually of value? Thanks for the question. Um, I think it's really interesting. I, I like the topic about human-centered AI because I fundamentally believe that um, technology is ultimately an enabler. And we should not really develop any product, any technology, until there's a need from the customer. So as a startup, that's the whole lean startup approach, and that's what we followed. Um, for the first six months in building our startup, we did not have any product, and we did not really spend time in building the technology. All we did was go out and talk to customers and understand what their problem was and what they really wanted. And only when we have the f had you know, a, a good idea and we felt comfortable that, hey, this is a problem we are hearing repeatedly and it seems to be real and there's something in it. And then we went out and we started getting LOIs from customers and we said, we can do this. It was just our confidence um, and the technology that we knew we can build but not having even a prototype, and we said, let us build this, give us time and funding, and we will build this product for you. And that's how we started. So I, I really fundamentally believe that it's important to hear what the customer is saying and only then building something uh, and making technology an enabler rather than sort of, you know, you know, it's not about losing jobs because of it. It's really about changing the kind of jobs we have, the kind of skills we have. All right. So um, for me, I think I, I, I was like smiling because earlier the quote you said this is very controversial, but I think I will kind of say that humans are not really that mean or vain or, you know, like humans are naturally nicer. I, I, I'm more on the positive I see, side. I see. Okay. You're, you're a positive <laughs> yeah. person, right? Yes. So I think it's um, being humans being humans, we are kind of have this survival instinct, right? So uh, what we usually do is that once we are, once we see a threat, then we tend to exhibit those kind of um, qualities. However, and from an AI perspective, right, like going back to the human-centered AI, I think once we have um, shown how uh, technology, how the evolution, how the advancements in technology could actually help humans augment where humans are kind of weak, and uh, then it becomes, they, they become more uh, less defensive, oh, right? I, yeah, I agree completely. Yes. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, uh, having the, the principles around AI were first from a technology company, it's actually our role uh, to um, help customers, help people to understand what really, what AI really is. Because sometimes, you know, maybe media, movies, all this have kind of, kind of put some negative flavor to AI, like AI will replace jobs, AI will kind of um, kick you out of the companies and all these, so all these negative stuff, sometimes we just have to, from a technology point of view, we just have to kind of share 
what technology, how technology can help you, right? So that's one. And second is actually it's not meant to replace humans, but actually to augment where humans are weak at. It's actually to help you, right? To help you do your jobs, to help you um, in various aspects of, um, of our lives, in the community, in the society. So there are many good things that can actually be uh, derived from it. So I guess, um, you know, like, there's so much potential in it, as long as, as you've said, you've centered it around um, humanity, understand the impact, and make sure it's towards the good, then I think there's, there's really a lot to it, yeah. Yes. Well, it's hard to add uh, to that, so I agree with, with those things, and it's true that one of the first challenge I may have most of the time is that, well, we either have uh, uh, stakeholders uh, understanding, I mean, who have an, uh, a, a goal to implement AI, and at the same time, they have a, a wrong understanding of what is AI. So the first thing when you talk to people, most of the time about AI, they see Terminator. So I think we can have a more realistic uh, kind of a threshold or a, a element of discussion, and that's what you were mentioning. So I agree on that. So how you go between the two, how you make sure that, well, AI is the right solution because potentially there is a lot of, tro of, of problems or issue or, or any kind of challenges who can be tackled and answered by more conventional algorithmic approach still. Uh, so that's one of the, of the elements. I think also there is a switch in the industry, uh, a change in the industry. We are not, even the, the process, the way we are, we are developing solution is not anymore where we give you uh, a, a set of requirements and we see you in six months and you deliver. We know with all the agile methodology, you can integrate user into the loop, being at the beginning, being at the middle. Every single sprint, you can figure out if you're going into the right direction. Because at the end, if, I don't know if, if, if to, re to take the code, if we are selfish and so on, I, I see it in a different way. Just we want something that makes a difference for us. It's not about selfishness, it's about being efficient. It's not so yeah, it's I, about so optimization. Yeah, exactly. If I don't need it, why would I open it? So I think that's uh the the, the whole industry is changing an AI project. Uh, we were talking about that before and typical projects initially all kind of technology projects were very linear. We had a set of requirements and you just knew you could even code precisely. You knew exactly how many days it will take you to go there. The problem is what we are doing in AI, because you have so many unstructured data, so many uh, uh, um, merging of data, making sense of many different hidden hidden patterns. It is not that linear anymore. You know, you go through iteration and you you try something. Sometimes you fail, but you learn something. Hopefully, then you do something else, and that's how you get to the objective, to the last. Uh, uh, to the solution you're going to provide to a, a consumer, hopefully. So I think those are the two. So to sum up our panel's opinions, I would s would it be right to say that building a human-centered AI means always being in touch with your end users, with your customers, and also maybe changing the way you work to becoming a lot more iterative, a lot more oriented around experimentation, just to make sure that you're constantly getting that customer feedback. So we've talked about the human side of human-centered AI, and I'd like to also touch on the more technical aspect of it. So again, I'm going to bring in another quote from Reid Hoffman, who's the CEO of LinkedIn, and he talks about this idea of blitzscaling. I don't know if anyone has heard about that. I'm sure as a startup founder, a lot of emphasis now is on hyper growth, where you're expanding into as many markets as possible, to as many customers as possible. And so, Charles and Janet, you both work with very global companies, and I know Needy as well as a startup founder, you're very concentrated and focused on growth. How do you manage this idea of hyperscale and growth with issues very human concerns like keeping in touch with your customers' needs and making sure that you continue to serve them. Do, do you have any specific stories or even horror stories, failures that, that you want to be like, open about? Um, well, as a startup, we're still in the initial phase. phase. So, um, you know, just going back to what Reid Hoffman says, he talks about um, startups going through a life cycle, um, starting as a family, so a very small team focusing on, a, on something uh, specific, moving to a village, a city, a nation. So that's how a startup sort of scales, and that's, 
that's where he talks about uh, you know sort of growing and scaling much more rapidly so we're still i would say at the at the initial stage at the family stage i think the challenge of growth at an initial stage is really about how do you make sure that you're able to say no to a customer you know you're able to keep focused on the product that you're trying to develop because yes you need to have that ambition um, you know that the startup starts with a particular customer segment and then scales across customer segments so you build a particular set of product and then you keep adding features and modules to it so so you make it grow so you need to have that ambition but still at the initial level it's really about how do you keep focused and how do you make sure that you're able to make because you have limited budget you have limited team and resources and time and you want to do the best possible in that um and make sure you deliver something great and not just something average across multiple segments and multiple prod, uh, sort of modules of pro of the product so i think at at this level it's really about how do we manage the interest that we're getting from customers but at the same time keep focused um and then the second thing related to growth is um as the startup grows and as we get more people we start with maybe one or two founders and as we start hiring people and talent um how do we make sure that we are still we thinking not just about the customer growth and the product growth but also the team growth you know so as founders how do we keep upskilling so that we can manage and we can lead people who join the company and how do we make sure that the people who are joining they integrate the and imbibe the culture that we have and they are taking ownership of the product and coming up with new ideas about how the product should be launched and scaled so i think those are sort of the growth challenges that we face um at the moment um maybe an example from the customer perspective also uh, you know relating to the discussion that we had earlier so about ai it's very hard for a user to just start trusting um an ai tool which gives a certain suggestion or an an uh, or a number or a or you know a data point when that user has been doing the same work for the last 30 50 years and saying hey i've done this all my life now you're saying this technology can tell me something better that i don't know so it's it's really about um while scaling not just you know not just giving that ai tool but also enabling the user so what we do is we we give the impact of uh, economic patterns on how cargo flows so if there's a us china trade war how is cargo going to be flowing between china and the us and how is that going to be different from how it was before the the trade wars um so if we just give a number that this is the new sort of demand or cargo flow that will happen between the two trade lanes um the user might say how do i trust the system or why do i trust the system but if we give a reason if we add meaning behind the ai and we say this is the amount of cargo we see flowing in the next few weeks between these two countries and these are the reasons why we think this is going to happen because the tariff prices are going to change because the currency rate is looking like this um because there's a typhoon in hong kong and so on and if we give those reasons and add meaning to ai that's where the user is more empowered and he starts believing in the ai tool much more so i think while we're growing we need to start thinking about what are those things that we built around the ai product that the users feel more comfortable um and want to use the product more so it's about building trust again right, we we come back to that word again and again funnily enough um janet and yeah okay um i think from um um a bigger organization perspective the 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 pros and cons in terms of scaling or the the challenges and the success stories are kind of different in a bigger organization so i guess in terms of growth um in a company like um oracle we are lucky to be have um to have access to assets and resources be coming from a from a big company right so with all these um um trends around you know technological innovation and all these it's easy for a company like us to kind of hire people hire more people even acquire companies like recently um you know like if you have heard about it the like oracle has acquired the datascience.com to kind of augment the the skills in ter uh, to, to augment the um the strength in terms of data science right so it's easy for companies like us to to do that easier right um uh, but at the same time i guess what if you more if you go more into um the action right so how do we actually help customers and so on and so forth there are different set of challenges right so uh, for bigger organizations typically we will be organized in different product groups and 
what does that mean is in terms of solutioning, it might be quite tough from a customer uh, point of view because if we talk about artificial intelligence, essentially what we are looking at, it's not a, a black boss, it's not a magic, it's like a not a black magic, right? So what it really is, is that AI consists of multiple technological components from data, management, from analytics, from applications. Basically, you can think of all the various components put together to make a machine intelligent, right? So if within an, a big company like us, uh, sometimes these components are being handled by multiple departments, you know. So collaboration in, te in terms of, you know, scaling solution, in terms of building something that is really um, relevant and useful for the customer is might, could be quite a challenging task. So for us um, who are in a kind of position to influence, to educate, our roles are actually very important from an internal perspective as well as from a customer side. Right, so it is for us to kind of, more than the technology itself, it's to push the education, push the awareness as to what really the solution around AI is. It's not just you know like a hype and so on. It's really putting down you know the thinking and 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 the impression like ten thousand feet or hundred thousand feet down to the ground and say this is how we actually do AI. So again, like going out and talking and educating people. I don't know about Charles as well. Do you find the same experience? Well, ah. Uh, so first, if we talk, if we talk in, in terms of growth and, and being able to expand your business tremendously uh, from one day to the following day, uh, I was in, I had created a startup before and we were quite successful. We were doing uh, credits, uh, so we were disbursing loans in the Philippines and we had our own credit scoring because it was targeting the unbanked people. Uh, I think that in terms of capabilities, I mean, you have fantastic technology today with AWS, the Google Cloud, obviously Oracle, of course. Uh, so it, it is very easy to scale on the architecture perspective. It is not a problem anymore. There is a cost issue, so you better sh be sure that your your schema and your infrastructure makes sense. Otherwise, you may have some big surprises. But otherwise, I it's fine. So, for example, in our cases, it's not tremendous numbers, but we went from few hundreds uh, applications on one day and the following day we had around 100,000 applications so and all infrastructure not a problem not nothing no down no load time and anything so that's one thing Cap in terms of technical capabilities not a problem in terms of having models capable to uh, to to get the personality of everyone I mean to have a model fits on I don't think it would work I think it there is a lot of differentiation that we would need to do uh, so I, I, I agree also in terms of explainability, even for the stakeholders. But I, I think the, the, the issue for me will be, or the challenge actually more than the issue, will be how you handle uh, differentiation between, uh, between the, the, the human, if we, if we could still talk into that human-centered perspective, is really explainability and how you handle differentiation and what answer you provide to that. And that's just a, a, a stakeholder answer to, to provide. Yeah, I think you've touched on a very interesting data science problem, actually, because you're now talking about many different customer segments. How do you optimize the model or essentially the service that you create to deliver what those customers want and actually give that personalized experience going from one model to a lot? So I think we have had a very good discussion Thank you a lot to the panel. I think we've had some interesting themes around making sure that you know what your customer wants, working in iterations, talking about collaboration, and this idea about trust actually becomes ever more important, even though we're talking about technology. So I would like to thank our panelists for their time, and also thank you to the audience for your attention. And with that, I will hand over Thanks a lot.